Welcome to Fuzzy Butts and Friends. Well, as much as it drives Fuzzy Butts around the world nuts when they hear me say it, I'm your host, your big dog, Luke Robinson, and I'm slap happy to welcome back this week again to have as our co-host, our co-pilot, Ginger Morgan, the Executive Director of Puppy Up Foundation. Ginger, how are you? I'm a little tired today since we had a puppy up walk yesterday, so. You did, you guys had a puppy up. <laughs> You did. did it. Congratulations. I was there. It was a wonderful event. Uh, the Puppy Up Foundation hosts uh, Puppy Up Walks all around the country uh, to uh, generate education and awareness about uh, uh, cancer and our canine companions. So congratulations. Uh, I was there. I got to do a little speech and I was able to post that on social media. Uh, this uh, what and that is a perfect segue into this week's I guess because she is a medical oncologist and she's gone from a practicing clinician to the world of startups. So she's just right up my alley as well. We're very, very happy this week to have Dr. Andy Flory. She's with Pet DX. She's a chief medical officer. Welcome, Dr. Flory. How are you? I'm good. How are you guys? It's great to be here. It's great to be here with you as well. Why don't we, you have an awfully, you have a lengthy uh, CV. So I always like to start the show with the most exciting part. So why oncology? Not everybody chooses, chooses that profession. It's a tough one for a lot of people. So how did you get from treating animals to oncology? That's a great question. So uh, when I was a third year in vet school, just heading into clinics, my own dog got diagnosed with cancer. And it was, as you can imagine, and as unfortunately you know, it was devastating for our family. He was a, you know, was a young dog. So you just kind of fall in love with this puppy. And then all of a sudden they're really sick and you're having to make these really difficult decisions for them. And so our meeting with the clinicians that were managing his case at the specialty hospital, the oncologist and the resident, it was so life-changing. It was just like the, the hope that they provided us in such a dark time just made me realize this is what I want to do. This is what I meant to do. And it, it, it very much felt like a, a calling. I don't know. It felt al almost meant to be like, it felt like he was put in my life and in my path for such a specific reason. And then as I sort of went through clinics and, you know, this is like your first introduction to clinical medicine, right. As a vet student. And, um, I got to see him and celebrate those kind of moments of like when his cancer went into remission and that was a big celebration uh, but then also he had um, a pretty severe reaction to a treatment that he received. And I was his, I got to kind of be his student and, and manage his care during the oncology rotation during that time. And just seeing kind of the, the impact of my presence on his ability to get better and to kind of pull through that crisis, it just, the whole thing was life-changing. And it really made me feel like this is what I'm meant to do. Absolutely. I think every single guest that we've had on Fuzzy Butts and Friends, uh, the common thread between each one of them is their, their story always begins with how a dog changed the course, the direction of their life. That's the common thread in all of our guests. What was the dog's name? His name was London. London. What a great name. What type of cancer, if you don't mind me asking? He had lymphoma and he was a collie. And so collies um, have a pretty high um, incidents of being affected with a gene mutation that actually makes it very difficult for them to tolerate certain chemotherapy drugs. And that's why he had such a severe reaction to his treatment. And so, you know, just everything about his case just fascinated me and like learning about his cancer and learning about that genetic mutation and learning about chemotherapy. It just, every single bit of it was like, I just wanted more and more and more. And I think you're so right. There's so many of us that are in specialty medicine that have like our superhero origin story, right? Like what, why did we get here and where did we come from? And it almost always starts with a dog as a mentor who in, has interviewed hundreds of prospective interns and residents, it always starts with that. There's always a story. Like there's always a reason that you get to from point A to point B. I love that superhero origin <laughs> story. We're, we're definitely going to use that with, uh, with the program that we're going to be launching because you're, you're right. And, and there is that, that backstory that I call it the inflection point. 
that you're sort of on a path and there's that one thing that changes the direction of it. And for me, of course, it was, was Malcolm and, and my dog as well. Um, but you said something that I want to get back to uh, just briefly, is that how London's case was managed, managed that really impacted you. And I just want to speak to the world of difference bedside manners. Uh, bedside manners matter to pet parents and how the uh, case is handled. So it sounds like you had some pretty good doctors um, handling London's case. Is that right? I, I have been so blessed in my career with mentors. And I, I think that it, it's so important in shaping the, the path of a trainee. But I really, I mean, I really lucked out with the, the mentors that I've had from vet school to internship to residency, even beyond that, the people that I have gotten to work with and learn from are just, they're, they're phenomenal. And I, I, you know, they, they're such a huge part of your story of how you become who you are, how you practice the things that you believe, you know, so it, it's so important who kind of trains you and guides you. Absolutely. So once, once you went through that harrowing experience uh, with uh, London's lymphoma, then what happened next? So after that, um, you know, I, I really, really realized that I wanted to pursue oncology and, um, you know, I just started asking a ton of questions because when, when you're in vet school, you have to sort of figure out which path you're going to take and how to get there. There's not like a, a handbook that's like, you want to be an oncologist, read this. Like, here's the, here's the checklist of what you do. And so you just have to sort of align with the people that got to that point and ask them how they got there and ask them for, you know, how can I get there? And so, like I said, I was just really lucky to have fantastic mentors that helped me so much. But through that, I got a truly amazing internship at um, a practice called Florida Veterinary Specialists in Tampa. And it's the hospital that was the original Blue Pearl, kind of before Blue Pearl was a thing. And so it just, that group is, uh, it was just such a, again, a great group to learn from and learn with. Um, and from there, I was really lucky enough to get a residency at Cornell. So I did my residency at Cornell in Ithaca, which is a fantastic place to live for three years. And then you're kind of tired of the very long winters and you're ready to get out of there. So um, I loved my time in Ithaca. It's such a special place. Uh, and so after my residency, then my first job was actually at the Animal Medical Center in New York City. And I don't know if you've been there, but it's a really special place. It's, um, it's have you been there? Oh, that's yeah. why it's uh, that's why it's one of the talking points that I that we gave you for the podcast is specifically on there for that purpose. We have been there many many times. In fact, we just interviewed uh, for the podcast uh, Dr. Ann Ohouse uh, and yeah. on, on for our podcast. And uh, more more importantly, it's got a special place in the Puppy Foundation's uh, uh, story as well because we funded a study there, um, specifically a study um, for diagnostic study for transitional cell. No, it was not diagnostic. It was uh, medical device to get chemo to a very, very problematic transitional cell carcinoma tumor. Yeah. Um, and Chick Weiss was the, the, the PI for that study. And I think Craig, Craig Clif Clifford was also on that study as well, right? Right, Ginger? That's correct. Um, that was one of our first studies at AMC. So we spent a lot of time there and we love the folks there. So I, that's when I saw that on your CV, I was like, why well, can't wait to talk to her about AMC. That was a wonderful know, experience. Oh my gosh, it's such a special place. It's obviously steeped in history. It's um, it's just so impressive in being the world's largest not-for-profit private practice specialty center. But also it's like, it's eight floors of veterinary medicine. And it's just the the, the cool stuff coming out of there is just beyond. And you're, it's also right in the heart of all of these human medical schools. And so we had the chance to collaborate, go to grand rounds, go to lectures at these human medical oncology conferences. It was just, it was, it was really, it's a great kind of marriage of academia and really kind of learning as much as you can about every single thing and private practice and just being able to help so many animals at the same time. It's such a special place. So was it AMC that you um, first studied, you got your feet wet, I guess, in clinical trials as a principal investigator? 
Well, I, I would say that that's, I kind of can credit my mentor at my residency for that, Ken Rasnick. He, um, he has such a, a brilliant mind for clinical research and he really got, he kind of gave me the bug for uh, clinical studies. I performed three during my residency because it just, I, it fascinates me, you know, the ability to not only treat and manage patients, but at the same time, try to help future patients by understanding their cancer better, understanding treatments better, understanding prognosis better. It's just, I think that it's, it is something that's inside the majority of oncologists is like, we, we want to, we want to constantly get more understanding of what we're doing and how we're, how we can best manage cases. I couldn't agree with you more. Um, you know, I, I, yeah, I, I'm friendly with uh, Sean Kana, and uh, one of the things that we always talk about is always telling me is like, you know, you meet so many oncologists on your travels, you know, try to get more of them into research. We got to get more researchers out there. Um, we, we just, well, that's something that's essential. So, but the, because the clinical pra practice is, is so alluring and so some of the oncologists, they prefer that. And um, uh, so we do our best to get more quality research out there. So how did you go from AMC, did you go from AMC to San Diego? So from New York City to San Diego, is that the next jump in your CV? I, I did, so. That's quite uh, a jump. <laughs> it is, my, my resident mate, Blaze Burke, who's a radiation oncologist, um, was out here in San Diego and he called me up and he said, we really need another medical oncologist. How do you feel about moving to San Diego? And I was like, who doesn't want to move to San Diego? <laughs> like it's, it's a dream destination, right? I had done um, a summer internship as a vet student in San Diego and so completely fell in love with the city, the lifestyle. It's just, it's such a great place to live. And um, so I, came out and interviewed and uh, was really um, so excited because the, the people that I met, you know, I think that when you meet a hospital, when you're considering a new position, there's really like a feeling that you get about the group. And it's really like the doctors, how happy they are, how much they get along, are they friends? And it's just instantly, I just hit it off with these people. And it's just such a great group of doctors. And so I just felt so lucky to have found a home here in San Diego for the last decade while I was um, kind of waiting because it was a brand new hospital that was being built a second site at Veterinary Specialty Hospital here in San Diego that I was starting the oncology service at. And it wasn't quite ready to go yet. And so I said, um, I really, I'm excited to start, but I also came across this opportunity to go and do some locum work in Sydney, Australia do you mind if I go do that for six months first? And they said, sure. And I was like, oh, really? Oh, this is so exciting. Okay, good. Um, so I got to go and work in Sydney for six months and learn that city. And what a great, great place to, to be and live for six months. It was really great. And so you, you practice veterinary medicine in Sydney, in Australia? Uh -huh. Yeah, there was I didn't see that. Wow. So yeah. tell, tell us about that. What's the difference like? Oh, man. Um, you know, I think when I first got there, you know, you're just, you're getting used to people's accents first. And so you're just sort of like, you spend a lot of time like listening to how just the, the cadence and try to, you know, pick up on all the lingo because they do use different words. One of the, the immediate biggest differences was when I walked in, um, the clients all call you by your first name. They do not use the Dr. Flory. They just say Andy. And so for someone that looks as young as I do. And, and I, and I have ever since I was a, a vet student and they were like, who are you? Doogie Hauser is the comment that I always used to get. Um, it was, it, for me, it was like, I had spent so much of my career making sure to say Dr. Flory, Dr. Flory. And so to now just not have to be called that anymore, it was sort of like really refreshing. So I really actually enjoyed that bit that I could just be Andy. That was nice. They have different drug names, so you just have to kind of get used to um, di slightly different things. Like instead of Benadryl, diphenhydramine that we have here in the U.S., they have chlorpheniramine, and everyone just calls it niramine. So when someone first said the word, I'm like, I don't know what you're saying. What are you talking about? <laughs> um, and then there were certain chemotherapy drugs that I was used to using in the U.S., um, or I wasn't used to using in the U.S. because of how expensive they were, and they either didn't have them or the really expensive drugs in the U S were like $5 in Sydney. And so, you know, I got, I actually got to experience 
completely new protocols and new ways of practicing medicine. So I found working in another country so refreshing and eye-opening and it really changed my practice for the better, I think. Well, I, I imagine that's true. Um, what, what about uh, cancer dogs? Uh, are you looking at, uh, do they have the kind of the top three to top five top cancers and, and dogs there as well, lymphoma, osteosart, mangio? So is it pretty much the landscape the same? It's pretty much the same. Yeah. The, the main difference in medicine is when I came in the first day to kind of tour the hospital, I saw all these dogs just laying in cages and it looked like they were just all sedated. And I was like, why are there so many sedated dogs just laying in cages? So they actually have something that's really prevalent there that is um, from a tick bite and it's called tick paralysis. And we don't have that really in the US the way they do. It is so prevalent that they literally, they, they come into emergency, they shave the whole dog, they find all the ticks, they remove them, and then they just wait for them to recover. And sometimes it's just a couple of hours and then they pop up and then they're fine. Um, and some dogs are really severely affected, but uh, that was one of the biggest practice things that, that I came across, but not a lot of differences in terms of cancer. What about uh, in terms of their treatments and diagnostic technologies? If you had to say that, if you had to compare Australia to the US, are they similar? Are they five years behind, 10 years behind, comparable? What, what's your assessment there? Very similar. Very similar, yep. good. Yeah, my, my ability to practice and do all the typical diagnostics and everything was the same, if not better in Australia. We could do, I, I remember specifically the CTs were much less expensive there. so. Um, you know, I, at that, at that time, anyway, I don't know if it's changed now, but, um, but other than that, very similar. That's wonderful. Cause, uh, we have talked to some people from different countries and they don't have all the tools or a lot of the tools in the toolbox that we, that we have over here. So, um, even though we have enough cancer dogs in America, 6 million new cases a year, I think is what we're using now. Um, statistically, um, yeah, we got our hands full, but uh, I, I, do, I think it's important. It is important for us to learn best practices from other countries and other peoples. That That is a tremendous benefit professionally. Yeah. Where did you go? So you went to Australia um, down under for a brief bit and you popped back over to San Diego and what's next on your CV? Yeah, so I, um, you know, practiced in San Diego um, at two kind of sister hospitals called Veterinary Specialty Hospital in San Diego. Um, I founded a um, a rotating internship at one of them, and I co-founded a specialty internship, a, an oncology internship at the other. And so I helped to direct and run both of those, um, and that's to me really rewarding. I think being able to give back by training our future veterinarians is just so important. And it's, it's a lot of, it gives me a lot of um, professional satisfaction. I think uh, that mentoring process, you know, I'm still in, in touch with all of my trainees and I, you know, still celebrate their accomplishments with them and their new jobs and their new kind of life steps. It's a, it's a relationship that lasts a really long time. And I, I just found it, find it incredibly rewarding. Well, it is. It is because um, training and teaching, I mean, that's the future generations. And, and especially if we're going to, to ensure um, the, the, the important things such as bedside manner, um, because whether I found, um, Dr. Flory, I found a lot in my travels that pet parents sometimes make medical decisions on behalf of their companion based on their experiences and their relationship with their veterinarian. Um, and sometimes it's also true with the relationship with the veterinary oncologist. So if you think about it that way, then um, the general practitioner, the GP, the standard veterinarian's relationship with the pet parent is frontline. It's essential to the war on cancer. So whatever you, you can do to help, I know that your internships were in oncology, but you know, whatever we could do to, to, to make sure the next subsequent generations um, interface and relate to pet parents and the, the trauma that they're going through. I've been through it personally three times. I've lost three of my, I've lost all three dogs that have passed in my life. I've lost all of them to cancer. And so, um, and Ginger's lost more than that. So I, I find that I just, any time I have a chance or an opportunity to talk to an oncologist about how important that rapport and that relationship um, is, I try to emphasize that because it can make the difference whether a pet parent determines to make to to pursue the proper gold standard treatment. 
Um, Absolutely. Yeah, I agree. And I, you know, I've been fortunate enough to um, mentor not just oncology interns, but um, rotating interns as well that are going to go out into general practice. And I see that year as so much more than learning the medicine. Like you're going to learn the medicine in your first year of practicing as a veterinarian anyway, like you're going to learn that. But I think the true value of an internship is to understand how to navigate difficult situations, not just medically, but communication wise and how to have those tough conversations when you have to break the news that it is cancer or that the cancer has spread or that the cancer has come back or that it's maybe time to consider saying goodbye. Those are really tough conversations for a new graduate to navigate. And that is a huge part of the internship experience. Yeah, because it's all predicated on one simple thing. You're making medical decisions on the, uh, for the life of another. And that life is not human, but that life has tremendous value. And that's the ultimate responsibility that a person can have in this life is when you make the decision between life and death, medical decisions, um, so that's, um, that, that's, that's wonderful that you did that. We, we really can't get enough, enough of it. So, so for a second time in your life, it seems like a dog would make a tremendous impact on the, the, the trajectory of your career. And that dog's name was Poppy. So tell us about Poppy. Yeah, Poppy, thank, I'm glad you picked up on that because she was like the next stepping stone in the path of my life. Like I, I really thought that London was my origin story and that was it. And that was, you know, not it, but that's what I was doing. And I was doing what I felt like I was called to do. And I was, um, you know, I had a really great career that I loved. And then I met a little dog named Poppy and she was one of my patients. She was um, my patient about three years ago now. She um, came to me with a diagnosis of a cancer that was pretty widespread by the time it was found. And she was only four years old. She was this little eight pound ball of fluff. I don't know if you can see her in the frame behind me, but she's this tiny little mixed breed dog. She is, um, you know, eight pounds soaking wet. She was mostly fluff. She had these big ears. She kind of looked like a little papillon mix with these big ears that kind of stuck out. And, you know, we don't, fortunately in oncology practice, we don't see a ton of very young dogs, right? We see a lot of dogs that are like eight, nine, 10, like that's kind of a very typical diagnosis age for, for cancer. Um, and so she was this four, little four-year-old dog. She had tons of energy. Everyone just immediately fell in love with her. And her cancer was pretty widespread already by the time it was diagnosed. And as a veterinarian to have to have that conversation with a family of, it's already so far spread that there's not a lot I can do to manage it long-term. I can always offer something to help her feel more comfortable and to give her more time of, of good quality of life. But my ability to cure this is almost zero. And even to provide long-term control is very low just because of how widespread it is. And that's, it's a devastating feeling because veterinarians, they really just want to help, right? They want to, they want to be able to help families and to be in that position where you have to say, you know, there's not a lot I can do. I can offer these things, but in terms of kind of providing that long-term um, control, my, my options are kind of minimal. Uh, you're, you're absolutely right. Um, and, uh, that's, I think that's why what you're working on is so powerful and why I wanted to have Pet DX so early on in Fuzzy Butts and Friends is because every time a pet parent gets that diagnosis, they're already behind. They're in some cases, they're tremendously behind because, and the, the difficulty is that we're fighting against nature because the way that nature designed a dog, if you think of it that way, is that, or, or most, most um, feral animals back a long time ago is that, that in the wild, they can't show pain. So they have either a higher threshold of pain or they don't evince pain to the extent that humans do. And so as a, as a consequence of that, like let's take bone cancer because I have a lot of, a lot of experience with that. And I've talked to so many bone, ca bone cancer pet parents around the country is that I've heard cases that sometimes a dog will run on a cancerous leg that has been spongified to the point that it will fracture out while they're galloping at full speed. And if you think about that, you think, wow, how much pain would that dog be experiencing? 
Um, and so that's the, the first, that's the first moment that that dog becomes symptomatic and that and the, the, the cancer becomes apparent to the pet parent. And so in that instance, you take that dog into the vet and bone cancer and 90% of the can 90 percent of the cases, the cancer is already spread to the lungs. So that's why it's so exciting. The work that you're doing with, with, with pet DX is because because we're always behind, always behind. How do we get that additional? But before we, we, we jump in to Onco K9 and that exciting pro, uh, pro, uh, product, um, the technology, let's get back to, to Poppy though. So, so yeah. Poppy was, so, so that was the lesson there is that you, you just, you, 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 you learned that Poppy just didn't have enough time to figure things out and fix anything. So yeah, so in Poppy's case, unfortunately, like so many dogs that I see in oncology practice, her cancer was found because of clinical signs, which is what we would call symptoms in people, right? So something that the owner can notice, that the pet parent can notice uh, is going on at home. And um, by the time dogs are showing those clinical signs, like you said, the majority of them have already advanced, right? They're they've either spread or they're just sometimes too big to do surgery or they're just in multiple locations in the body. And so it means that our current paradigm, which is detect cancer because the family notices something is going on, it's just not, it's not working. Like we're, we're detecting so many cancers so late at the point in which we can't provide that long-term control or cure. And so this was devastating for Poppy's family. Obviously, she was only four years old. Um, and, you know, having a dog be diagnosed with such extensive cancer at such a young age was just absolutely devastating. So the reason that this all happened was Poppy's dad is Daniel Grosu. He's an MD by training and his background is in genomics and liquid biopsy. And as we were managing Poppy's care, we worked really collaboratively together. And he said, you know, why, why aren't the genomics tests that I'm used to ordering for people available for dogs? And I was like, well, that would be great. But as veterinarians, we don't usually get those really cool diagnostic tests for like 10, 20 years, right? Until they either become less expensive or someone just has the passion to develop them. And he said, well, I have the experience and I have the contacts. And do you think that this is something that veterinary medicine could benefit from. And I just thought, if I had a nickel for every time a pet parent asked me, isn't there a blood test for cancer? <laughs> I would be very rich. So I said, I, I think like, I really think that pet parents, veterinarians would love a non-invasive way to test for cancer and to try to detect it early. And so we co-founded PetDX back in 2019. And um, you know, we're just really excited to have made so much progress in a little under three years. It's just really, really exciting to get to develop this non-invasive cancer detection testing for dogs. Let's talk. Uh, yeah, it's just it's just wonderful and exciting. Um, and I know Ginger and I both want to talk to you about how we can get some of our kids um, checked out um, with Onco K9. Um, but let's talk about existing diagnostic technology before we get into that. What is, because I like what you said. I like the way you said it, Dr. Floor. You said it's sign and then detect, right? That the, that the, the, the patient, the, 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 our canine companion, the dog has to have some type of sign or clinical sign or symptom, and then you do the detection. But we know uh, now from um, our understanding that cancer the oncogenesis process begins way, way before that. And so talk about that, um, where cancer begins and where traditional diagnostics, how they work and how far behind in the process are we, our pet parents typically? Oh, that's a great question. You know, from human cancer development models, it's clear that it takes many years for cancer to develop in the body, meaning that there, there's the presence of abnormal cells in the body, and it takes years for that to become to the point that it causes clinical signs. Meaning there's this big lag period where cancer is present, cells are dividing in the body, and, uh, but not yet causing signs and symptoms. And that means that's an opportunity, right? For us to be able to detect cancer 
before it causes clinical signs, because that would be the best point to intervene, right? Is if, if we can catch it before it causes clinical signs, for example, we know that um, the chance that it's going to be earlier stage, a smaller cancer, not yet spread, the patient's gonna feel better. All of those things are going to mean that there's the potential for the treatment to be more effective. And so the earlier we can catch cancer, the better the outcome typically. And that's why they have screening programs for people, right? That's why as we get older, we go through those tests that our doctors tell us to do. We do PSA tests and mammograms and colonoscopies and all of those things. And those are tests that are done on a serial basis, meaning you don't just have it one time, you have it multiple times throughout your lifetime to try to catch cancer as early as possible because it's known that there's a survival benefit to catching those cancers early. And we really don't have screening, cancer screening, in our canine companions in the veterinary oncology or veterinary world, do we? It doesn't exist, correct? We don't have anything specific. You know, what we do have is a recommendation for dogs to have an annual exam and lab work, like a standard kind of routine combination of lab tests like CBC, chemistry, and urinalysis. And, so, and as dogs are getting older twice a year to see their vet and to really monitor, those tests are great and they absolutely should, should be continued. They catch a lot of things. They catch kind of clues here and there of, of what might be starting or what might be going on. But for cancer specifically, that's an insensitive combination of tests to detect the vast majority of cancers early. It really is. I, actually, I, I don't want to criticize um, at all by saying this, but but just because you have elevated liver enzymes does not mean necessarily you have uh, liver cancer or just because there's an absence of elevated liver enzymes does not mean that you don't have liver cancer. So looking at white blood cell count and 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 and, and uh, renal um, output and things like that, that's important. And that gives us um, some clues, like you said but it by no means gives us a, 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 an accurate or fair and accurate picture of how that organ or that or organ system is functioning, first of all, and second of all, or fu functioning properly. And if it's not, whether cancer is, is, a, is involved. So, so what I, you know, I, I talked to Dr. Khanna, I, I like to use him and refer back to him because I learned so much about the, the, the process of uh, uh, metastasis and, and, and cancer cells and, and, and oncogenesis. And I find it fascinating because most people think that cancer is just like this indestructible thing, but it's, it's really not. It's not like, it's like any other cell and cancer can start, a tumor can start, but it also cannot survive. So I think what I, what I like about, what I love about, what I find exciting about this technology is the fact that you're constantly, just constantly searching the bloodstream for any type of fragments or any type of cell fragments or DNA that could look anything like cancer, right? And how sensitive is, uh, is that testing? So um, what we're looking for is um, something called cell-free DNA. So every cell in the body, except for mature red blood cells, has the entire genome in it, which is, just, it's mind blowing, right? The genome is the entire set of instructions in your DNA and every single bit of that is present in every cell in the body. That's a whole lot of DNA in there. Cells are constantly turning over, right? They're constantly undergoing programmed cell death or they're dying by other means like necrosis. And when they do so, all of that contents of the cell gets spilled out into the bloodstream and that includes all of that DNA. So in the bloodstream, that DNA gets broken down into little fragments. And those fragments that are circulating in the blood outside of any cell, is called cell-free DNA. And cell-free DNA comes from normal cells, but it also comes from cancer cells. And so we call that subset that comes from cancer cells circulating tumor DNA or CT DNA. And so that's what we're really looking for is we're looking at these little fragments of DNA. We're, we're finding them in the bloodstream. We're sequencing them with a technology called next generation sequencing. And I compare it to it's kind of like when you put something through the paper shredder and you get all these little pieces and fragments that come out the other end. So it's kind of like taking all of these fragments, figuring out where do they fit in the genome in that entire kind of length of DNA, and then looking in the fragments to find out are there abnormalities that are known to be associated with cancer. And so some examples include, there can just be a single letter spelling mistake 
in the DNA. Those are called single nucleotide variants, SNVs, or there can be changes in really long stretches of the DNA. Those are called copy number variants, CNVs, where you've got very large gains or losses of DNA that shouldn't be there. These are changes in the DNA that don't exist in a healthy individual. They don't exist in conditions like inflammation or cancer. So nothing is gonna change the underlying DNA besides cancer. And that's really the underlying cause of cancer is when you have these abnormalities in the DNA. So that's really what we're looking for is we're looking in the cell-free DNA in the blood for these abnormalities that are known to be associated with cancer. And do, do all, is that, do, is it true of every type of cancer that they have the CT DNA um, that's, that's in the bloodstream? So I guess my question is, are you um, potentially able and capable of detecting DNA fragments from potentially every type of cancer in the bloodstream? Or is there any particular type of cancer that, that it's not detectable, that CT DNA is not detectable in the bloodstream? Yeah, great question. So what we're talking about here is this term liquid biopsy. That's really what this test is, right? And so what that term liquid biopsy means is looking, in, looking for a biomarker in um, a liquid in the body that can be sampled through minimally invasive means. And so there's different liquids in the body, right? There's blood, there's urine, there's sometimes tumors will produce fluid or effusions. Um, there's um, CSF, so cerebral spinal fluid that's, you know, bathes the brain and the spinal cord. So what our test is, is for blood. It's, it's a blood-based liquid biopsy. Um, and if you think about biologically, there are differences in why a tumor might spill their biomarker into a different liquid in the body just because of location. So if you think about tumors that are associated with the urinary tract, for example, bladder, kidney, prostate, those are tumors that are probably going to spill more of their biomarker into the urine rather than into the blood. So the ability for a blood-based liquid biopsy to detect a cancer like that is going to be lower. Also central nervous system tumors, um, you know, they may be more likely to spill their biomarker into the CSF rather than the blood. So there are some specific biologic differences that, uh, that indicate that not all cancers are kind of created equal when it comes to being able to be detected by liquid biopsy. So the Onco K9, which is your flagship technology, that's specifically for blood um, CT DNA. Correct. Right. That's accurate. So what, so how would you characterize in terms of canine, all of the different types of cancers that dogs get? Did the, the onco canine, how, how many cancers does that cover and what type of cancers are we talking about? Great question. So it's been shown to be able to detect 30 different types of wow. cancer. Yeah. So it's really, it truly is at what we call it, and this is a, a term of art that comes from the human liquid biopsy space. It's called a multi-cancer early detection or MSED test, meaning it can detect the underlying abnormalities in the DNA that are present in a wide variety of cancers. They're not, it's not just a single cancer type or two that we're looking for. It is the underlying changes that exist in, in multiple cancers. That's, that's unbelievable. Do, can you, can you list, um, I have so many questions of trying to try to, trying to order them and category and structure them. So can you, are you able to, to list the types of questions, uh, cancers, um, first of all, and then second of all, like, like, uh, human drugs, do you have to go to through clinical trials for, to, to get indications? Is that, how does that work? Okay. Yeah. I can talk about that. So, you know, when we looked at the results, we really wanted to kind of focus in on big groups of cancers, because this is a multi-cancer test, we wanted to say, like, what are the most aggressive cancers that veterinarians manage? And those, without a doubt, are lymphoma, hemangiosarcoma, and osteosarcoma. And in that group of those big three, I call them, the detection rate is 85%, meaning in dogs with one of those three cancers, we could detect that abnormal cancer signal in 85% of dogs in a blood sample, which is just truly phenomenal. When we looked at the eight most common cancers that veterinarians manage, so if we add to those big three, mast cell tumor, soft tissue sarcoma, um, anal sac adenocarcinoma, melanoma, and mammary gland carcinoma, our detection rate is 62%. 
So that's really what veterinarians are seeing, right? These are the most common cancers that they're managing in practice, that they're diagnosing in practice, and the test could detect 62% of those. Those numbers are, are phenomenal. Um, yeah. I have so many questions. I mean, I, I just those numbers alone. I think we we, we talked to initially, and I'm I'm a I'm one of those true believer pet parents that even if the numbers were half of that, I would I would get the liquid biopsy every single time. Um, but that's just unbelievable. But so let's just so walk me through the process. So um, so you do the the um, Aco Canine um, liquid biopsy, and let's just say that. You see some CT DNA fragments that seem to indicate that that the dog might have um, let's use hemangiosarcoma as as one of them, the big threes. So what are the the next steps? Because that's so early, it could be potentially so early stage that there might not actually be a mass formed, correct? So what's the next step? That's um that's pretty uncommon to uh to be able to detect cancer when a tumor is, for example, like at a microscopic stage. That's okay. not really so, you know, the ability to detect a cancer signal is for the most part going to come from a cancer that is above what we call that limit of clinical detection, which is about a billion cancer cells. And that generally means that it should be findable in the body. And so generally the next step after getting a positive oncocanine test, which is called cancer signal detected, is to uh, really go on what we call the confirmatory cancer evaluation, but you could loosely think of as the cancer hunt. Yeah, you're right? just, it's to find the tumor, right? Now you've got to find it, right? Yeah, you have to find where is the signal coming from, right? And so you can probably imagine the kind of tests that would be helpful in that it would be a really thorough history. So that veterinarian really talking to that owner, any has anything changed? Like, you know, are you noticing anything new at home? Um, doing a really thorough physical exam to remember to look in the back of the mouth and do an anal sac uh, palpation and like, you know, look for all of the possible areas that cancer could hide. Doing imaging tests to look inside of the body. So chest x-rays, um, ideally an ultrasound or some other form of imaging of the abdomen to look and see if any there's any evidence of a mass or enlarged lymph nodes or enlarged organ. And then if anything is found, aspirating any lumps, bumps, you know, skin masses, subcutaneous masses, enlarged lymph nodes, lesions that are found on ultrasound to see if this is where the signal is coming from. When we have sort of looked at a group of cases we kind of said, like, let's just kind of see how veterinarians are using the test and how often they're getting a cancer diagnosis. And we kind of took 500 consecutive cases and did a little analysis. And so for those um, cases, for the patients that received a positive oncocanine test and then had a complete workup, cancer was found 85% of the time. So really it's kind of showing that the majority of the time that you get a positive test we are finding cancer. And that's one of the things I wanted to point out with the detection rate that I mentioned earlier is we were able to do this with an incredibly low false positive rate of only 1.5%, which is just really phenomenal in a diagnosis. It is, and I was going to get to that, but I, I, I just want to make it clear because to me, this is so important that, so it's reasonable. So it's accurate to say that if you do get a positive result from, from, from your test, that, that there is a mass, 80, 80, 85% of the time, there is actually a mass somewhere. So as a pet parent, if they take the um, Onco K9 test and you get a positive result, it's most likely then your kid has cancer, correct? So, so yeah, that's a good way to put it. So um, one, of the, one of the things that I think is helpful is not just when we talk about tests, a lot of times we get focused on sensitivity and specificity. And those numbers are really great to think about how does the test perform. But once you have actually done it on a patient and you have your 11-year-old golden retriever patient standing in front of you and you have a positive report, what does it mean for that dog? So for that dog, then that value that becomes really important in interpreting the result is called the positive predictive value or the PPV. And so for that, uh, that particular patient and, and for this test for a particular patient, the chance that that dog has cancer in light of a positive test result is over 70% to about 96%. And it really depends on why you're doing the test. So 
Um, you know, if this is a test that you've done because you suspected cancer versus if this is a test that you've done because this is just a dog that's at high risk of cancer. And that's how you kind of figure out, well, what is the specific PPV for this particular dog? But it means that most of the time when you get a positive test, that dog will actually prove to be diagnosed with cancer. So it's very important to go ahead and do that workup and look for cancer to try to find it early. Right. Well, walk us through what, what advice uh, Pet DX is giving pet parents through, through veterinarians. So what age do we, do we typically start the screening um, with Uncle K9? What, 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 treat me like I'm, I'm a pet parent, the pet parent that I am. I have, um, goodness, I was going to say he's 11 years old, but he's a 10-year-old Great Pyr Pyrenees, Indiana. And thank God, knock on wood, um, no cancer yet mm -hmm. at all we've seen. Um, had a bit of a scare, but there were lipomas. So I, I this, so I have a selfish reason for having you on. I want the uncle canine. I want him to 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 do the detection test because I'm always concerned. He's now ten, of course, and he's a large breed. So um, so every year every year that goes by, he's at a greater risk. So talk to me like um, that. I'm a pet parent. I'm going in the veterinarian with a ten year old Great Pyrenees. How would you recommend um, Uncle Canine for me? Yeah, there's two reasons that a veterinarian would recommend Uncle K9 to a pet parent. The first would be as a screening test to try to find cancer early before clinical signs develop. And so it's recommended as an annual screening test, meaning once a year for dogs that are at higher risk of cancer. And dogs could be at higher risk of cancer due to two main reasons. One would be their age and the second would be their breed. So we know that there's a nine times higher risk of cancer over the age of seven. And so we recommend to start annual oncocanine testing at the age of seven for all dogs. But there are certain breeds that are um, predisposed to developing cancer at younger ages. And you're nodding, I think, because you can probably already say, if you're very familiar with the osteosarcoma world, then you're familiar with things like giant breed dogs tend to, unfortunately, have shorter lifespans and short have the predisposition to developing cancer at younger ages, for example. So there are some breeds that should really start that cancer screening as young as the age of four. And it really just depends on, um, I think, when that breed is known to be predisposed to developing cancer, but also just a very personal conversation between the family and the veterinarian in terms of when does it make sense to start cancer screening for this individual. Yeah, I think predisposition for cancer, that's, that's a, a one of the, that's, that's a critical variable in that equation because, you know, I, one of the things traveling cross country, meeting so many pet parents that have, have gone through cancer and their kids before, I always ask, you know, what was the age of diagnosis? And, and I always thought, um, you know, with osteosarc, it's typically, you know, a, a typically four or five, I think five was when um, Malcolm got it, but you know, I've seen dogs as young as one and two get bone cancer. I've seen a dog as, as young as six months get lymphoma, and that's not even the, the earliest. Um, I think it was Red Bank in New Jersey, they pulled a mast cell tumor off a six or eight, eight week old puppy. So, those are obviously outliers, of course, but 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 I, I look at more specific when you say breed specific cancers, I think of um, uh, the Bernese Mountain Dog in Histio. Um, that just, I think that's cut their, av their average lifespan by several, several years. And Histio is not one of the, the obviously the, the big ones that you're working on, but it is a critical one. Um, so I was able to detect histiocytic sarcoma. So, um, you are. oh yeah. And so wow. I think you hit the nail on the head, you know, the, the breeds that I see where it's just like this breed gets so much cancer is flat-coated retrievers, Bernie's mountain dogs, golden retrievers. Like these are breeds that they, so many of them get cancer and, and pet parents that own these breeds typically are aware of that. And they're looking for a way to try to detect cancer earlier. So this is the, the perfect opportunity, I think, to do that. And it would be really great to um, be able to screen a big group of Bernie's mountain dogs or flat coated retrievers or, you know, that sort of thing. And, and sort of see, um, our ability to detect these cancers earlier. Cause it is, you're right. It's just devastating in these breeds. Yeah. I, we have a, a, a bunch of supporters in the burn burner community. So we, that's why I was thinking about it. We, we totally want to get, uh, Onco K9 to them because that's, that's the bane of their existence. They're always, dreadful frightened of of the, the histiocytic um diagnosis 
Um, so I'm how do you on, on a project to do that? I mean, if, if that would be such a great collaboration to be able to test some of those dogs. I, I hope so. Well, let's stick with that right there. How can we, how can we help? How can we get more groups tested? How can we take what you guys have discovered and learned so far and expand on that? Um, well, I mean, I think the first is just getting the message out there. Ginger, you were saying before we started about your, um, the challenge of trying to like, how do I get this test? And that is because it's new, you know, the phase that we're in right now is education, education, education. We really need to teach veterinarians about the test, about genomics. You know, genomics is not, which is the science behind why this all works is not something that as veterinarians, we learned in vet school, right? We just, it's not really part of um, our daily practice, it's not something that a lot of us have familiarity with. Um, and so we're, we're really, our target right now is educating as many veterinarians as we can on this to kind of really teach them about the science behind this and just how amazing it is and how it really can, it seems like science fiction, but it really can detect 30 types of cancer with just a simple blood draw. It's just, it's mind blowing. And so number one is just getting the word out there um, and letting veterinarians know that they, um, most of them have immediate access to the test right now because the test can be um, performed either through our company, PetDX. Uh, and so it requires a special kit because it requires some special blood collection tubes that stabilize those delicate little fragments of DNA. Uh, and so the veterinarian needs to have a special kit to be able to pull the sample. And so those kits are either available through us, through PetDX, or they're also available through major veterinary diagnostic distributors. So for example, IDEX and things like that, they can call and request kits. So um, you know, many veterinarians are um, customers of those diagnostic distributors and can call up and order those kits now. Okay, just to clarify, so I as a pet parent can actually um, order one of your tests and then take that to the veterinarian or ha they have to acquire that? No, it's actually by prescription. So it has to be ordered by the veterinarian. So the veterinary hospital orders the kits and then they pull the sample at their clinic. Got it. So you're entirely dependent upon veterinarians, general practitioners then to basically um, promote and educate pet parents about Onco Canine, correct? Absolutely. Yeah. And wow, I wouldn't want it any other way. This is, you know, it's just like any other um, test, it's, it requires uh, a real professional finesse to interpret results in light of the patient that you're testing, you know, and so it really does require um, a, a veterinarian, an expert to pull the sample, interpret the results, and then talk to the family about what is our plan going forward. Well, that the first part of that's true, but I'm going to flip the switch because one thing I've experienced a lot of my, my 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 travels is that veterinarians and also oncologists, veterinary oncologists, don't always do a really good job of conveying the um, value proposition of of, of cutting edge diagnostic technology like Onco K9, and that's that's what I hope and I think that Fuzzy Butts. What we're trying to accomplish here at Fuzzy Butts and Friends is try to take something as complex as genomics. And, and diagnostics and the um, uh, CT DNA fragments and that whole, um, that whole process and, and explain to pet parents why you should do it. And so that's why I'm excited about it. And that's one of the things I hope we accomplish here is that every pet parent should know that, that Onco K9 is readily available right now, correct? That's right, yeah. yeah. So every pet parent needs to know that A, you can do this right now you can go to your veterinarian and the veterinarian can, what happens then? You can go talk to your vet and say, hey, I would like to get the Onco K9 for my kid. And they order the test, is that right? Yep, absolutely. You could, um, they could talk to their veterinarian. They could also go to our website and um, register their interest and register their veterinarians, uh, the veterinary practice. And we can reach out to them and let them know, hey, there's this new diagnostic test let us come and tell you about it. Let us tell you about this fantastic new technology that could help to find cancer earlier in your patients. Yeah, I want to, um, when we spoke earlier and I kind of, I don't know how to do this yet, but I'm excited about it. I would like to uh, take this podcast and carry it forward and, and, uh, and, and, and actually take Indiana and have him do one of the Onco Canine tests. So I think Ginger, you had recommended. So, so I should be able to take so I should be able to, to contact um, 
Dr. Covington here in, in Memphis, um, who's right now Indiana's GP, and, and she should be able to order the test and we could do it there, correct? That's right. As long as she is, um, you know, a customer of one of the major veterinary diagnostic distributors okay. that um, offers a test or the other option is that she can sign up with us directly and then we can um, just provide her the kits direct. Well, cool, because what I would like to do is I, I want to take Indiana through this entire process so that pet parents can see it from start to finish. And, and uh, yeah, so um, that's uh, I think, Ginger, you want to do it with some of your kids as well, right? I do. Um, and I did go to your website and I signed up a couple of the veterinarians. I want to say, Lou, that I signed. Um, well, I don't know if I signed them up, but I went through the process of letting you guys know that I wanted to go there. And I think I did put Dr. Covington in there, but I'll um, go back and do that again, make, just to make sure. But yeah, yeah I would love to do it. Yeah, because um, for, for me, I don't think I'm that much of an outlier in the sense that I, I think the average reasonable pet parent would, would, would make a, an investment uh, for the additional um, comfort of mind, peace of mind, knowing that, you know, at least in the foreseeable future, that their kid doesn't have anything that pops up on the radar um, immediately. So let's let's not let's let's kind of break that down a little bit because I know that's going to be a, a question. And it's a tough question because well, pricing in the veterinary uh, market's tough anyway. So what are we looking about in terms of of cost for the Onco Canine, Dr. Flory? And then, then the second question would be: Are insurance carriers covering it right now? Oh yeah, great question. I would say the majority, you know, as you know, the the price that the hospital charges for the test is completely up to them. So they make those decisions. I would say most veterinarians are charging around 500 for this test right now, but it certainly can be higher than that. Um, in terms of insurance companies, the companies that we've talked to have indicated that they are mostly covering the test as an aid in diagnosis. And what that means is that if the veterinarian suspects cancer in that patient because of their clinical presentation, then a lot of those insurance companies are covering the cost of that, but they're not yet covering it for the screening indication, meaning this is a 10-year-old Great Pyrenees that doesn't have any current suspicion of cancer based on their physical exam or whatever the kind of, you know, your history or, or anything like that. But this is just a dog that is known to be at higher risk of cancer because of their age or their breed or both. And that's, uh, that's the screening indication. So most insurance companies are not covering for that yet. And it's the same on the human side, actually, for the same technology. Um, but I think that when we give it time, it's going to become very clear that these tests are so helpful in identifying cancer earlier that insurance companies my feeling, I'm optimistic about it being covered eventually. Yeah, well, MCED and um, I like the other uh, NGS. Um, it seems like that they're, it's the beginning of that technology and it's just gonna, it's, it's transformative technology essentially. And, and you're right, we're so early in the adoption of, of this technology that, that uh, people will, we, we will be talking about it more and it will be more, a lot more accessible. But I wanna take Indiana throughout this entire process. I wanna get him an Onco K9. I wanna, wanna, do that, uh, wanna do that and then potentially have a follow-up podcast or somehow to do an episode, follow-up episode or something so that the pet parents can see it. But, but just talking about price, I find, that, um, I find that always an interesting topic because the way I look at it is, is this way, is that if you think that the average, if, if, if early detection or screening begins at seven, unless you have one of the high risk dogs that we talked about, um, then you know $500 a year annually is just not that much money for you to have that additional peace of mind and, and comfort knowing that there's not bone cancer, you know, three months down the road um, where you're looking at amputation and all the other things um, that, that come with that type of cancer. So uh, I, I like to think of myself as an outlier, but then I look at it, I like to think of, I look at it rationally and think I would, every day I would, I would easily pay $500 to have that, that peace of mind. So we're going to do it with Indiana um, because he's 10 and uh, knock on wood, we haven't had anything happen to him yet. And so I'm excited to do that and take them through the process. Um, is there anything else, Dr. Flory, 
that 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 you would like to share or, or talk to and speak to the pet parent that's going through cancer for the first time or just hasn't gone through cancer for the first time at all? What would you like to say to them? I think that one of the most common questions I get as an oncologist when I meet families for the first time is, um, how long has my dog had this? And then the other question is, what can I do to avoid this happening in my other dog? Right. That is, those are kind of some of the most common questions. And what's becoming clear in as we do research into this is that we can detect cancer signal in the blood many months before dogs start to show clinical signs, meaning there is an opportunity. So even though we don't have those that same screening paradigm to find cancer earlier in dogs uh, currently, this is a new ability to do that. And so just like in people, we have this new ability to screen for multiple cancers and potentially find it earlier. And especially for the other dog in the family, you know, after a, um, a family has been through cancer diagnosis and treatment with one dog, it's so devastating. And you just want to feel like you can help and do something for your other four-legged family members. And so this is really um, such a great way that you can help and try to find it earlier in them. Yeah. Um, the statistics are staggering, Dr. Flory. Some breeds, 60, 70 percent, um, let's say a golden retriever will die of cancer. When you look at it, numbers like that, and you also look into the fact that we're living to be older, it's almost like cancer is coming for all of us. It's almost like it's predestined. So find it as early as we can or detect it as early as we can and then find the source of the cancer is really what Onco Canine is all about. Is that fair? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I think that if any of us, me, you, our family members, our dogs, our cats, if they're going to be diagnosed with cancer, the best bet and the, the most surefire way to have any ability to treat that cancer is if you can find it early enough. If you only find it once it has already spread, our chance of really providing that long-term control is so low. So that's really the biggest tool. It is the, the best option for beating cancer is finding it early. Exactly. I'll say it another way. And, if, and, and this is how it was taught to me. It's almost always the second tumor that's the killer. So if you can find the original primary um, cancer and, and address that, this is, that prevents hopefully the catastrophic event, the, the catastrophic outcome. So um, I'm a big fan of Pet DX, Dr. Flory, and Onco K9, and what you guys, the wonderful work that you're doing there. Um, Ginger, did I did I miss anything, or have we covered everything this episode? Um, you know, I think you covered everything. I just think that it's so exciting, and I can't wait to sign my two dogs up. <laughs> yeah, let's get them all tested. I would love that. I, well, I am ready. I, I'm, I, like I said uh, earlier, I'm, I've been researching in Memphis and I'm not giving up. <laughs> okay, great. Yeah. Well, we can definitely help you guys out there. Yeah. But. Consider us, uh, consider us customers um, and lifetime customers of that. So one of the things uh, before we go that we like to do every episode of Fuzzy Butts and Friends, um, since we talked about hemangiosarcoma, we like to take a moment um, even though this, this entire episode has been about cancer and our canine companions, not all of our episodes are about that. We like to take a second towards the end of the show and, and do a Puppy Up Foundation cancer tip. So Ginger, take it away. Well, as you said, I was going to talk about hemangiosarcoma, but the, the whole, this whole episode has been about early detection. And that's, you know, that's kind of what, that's my platform. I'm always talking about early detection. So, you know, getting this, um, the blood test and having that done is great. And um, what I was going to say about hemangiosarcoma is that and you and Dr. Flory, you're the veterinarian, not me. So correct me if I'm wrong. But um, what I read, it was like 43% of the tumors on spleens wind up being um, hemangiosarcoma. And but the only way now, without your test, is to actually have the tumor removed and the spleen removed to find out actually whether or not it is a, it's, if it's cancerous or if it's not. So, and I'm correct with that, right? Because you said you guys could detect hemangio with your, with your test, right? 
That's right. And we've actually had um, many cases at this point of identifying a cancer signal in the blood. And because of that, the patient having a workup and finding hemangiosarcoma before they have any bleeding. And that is, that's the devastating outcome of hemangiosarcoma, right? Is they usually present because they're bleeding, they're collapsing, they're bleeding into their belly or into the sac around their heart. And it's so advanced by the time we find it. And it's, it's a really um, traumatic event to go through for the family, for the pet. Uh, and so to be able to avoid that and find it before that happens is it's so phenomenal. It's such a, a fantastic uh, demonstration of the power of this technology. I, I love what you guys are doing. Um, yeah. Like That's I said, about, we're on a mission. <laughs> That's a powerful way to end the episode is you're right. Mangio is one of those catastrophic killers where it happens so fast. It's so sudden and it's so catastrophic. Pet parents are just, they're blindsided, right? And so pet parents everywhere, they're listening to Fuzzy Butts and Friends. Please uh, go to uh, PetDX's website, learn more about Onco K9 and talk to your GP, your veterinarian, about if you if you have one of the the breeds out there that are in the high risk categories, we're going to try to post. Do you guys have a link to that, uh, Doctor Four, on your on your website? Sort of the high risk, or is that out there? I would love to link to that, Ginger, in our show notes. Um, some of the high risk breeds we know what they are: the Golden Retrievers, you got the American Bulldogs, um, the Westies, the, the the bladder cancer. So we'll try to post a list of that. George show notes because pet parents, if you have one of the high risk, you need to know it and you need to know everything you can about Pet DX and Onco K9. Dr. Flory, yep. thank you so much for your time today here. You are indeed a friend of the Fuzzy Butts, and you and, and, and Pet DX are welcome back here anytime. So thank you for being on our show. Thank, thank you. you so much for having me. This has been wonderful. Thank All you. right. That's my sign that I run out of laptop battery power. I just, as we're winding down the show, I realized I didn't, I didn't connect the power cord on my laptop. So thank you for joining us here at Fuzzy Butts and Friends. We'll talk to you on the next episode. Puppy up. Talk soon. <laughs>